Okay, so a pleasant good afternoon uh, to all. So today we'll be looking at muscles. Muscles are very important, right? Because in terms of movement and organ systems, as was previously mentioned, you have the skeletal system, nervous system, and muscular system interacting together. And this is how movement is brought about. So without the interaction of these three organ systems, movement would be virtually impossible. So muscles, of course, this is probably the most visible of the lot because we could see it in terms of when, in particular, when it is developed. Those of us who like to go to the gym, those of us who like to be runners or run or exercise a lot, or some of us who are so blessed in terms of a genetic predisposition to just have big muscles. So they usually show themselves in that regard. So muscles are very important. And today we'll be looking at how the different types of muscles and also their functioning. All right, so let's go. Now, when we think, uh, when we think about muscle, the word muscle could refer to both an organ or a tissue. They do make up and when we think about it in terms of organ or tissue, one thing that comes to mind is the heart. The heart is both, it's an organ, and of course it's a muscle in terms of tissue. So very important there. Now, in terms of the muscle itself, it makes up approximately 40 to 50% of your total body weight and can contract on both conscious unconscious command and they're responsible for movement. And again, as we mentioned, this movement is brought about in particular when you do have interaction with the other two organ systems, the skeletal system and the nervous system. So what is the particular function of muscles? Well, muscles convert chemical energy into mechanical force. And in so doing, they move body parts, maintain body posture, and stabilize joints, adjust the volume of hollow substructures, for example, bladder. So when you look at some of these structures, in particular with the bladder, it is the movement of the muscles that do cause the emptying of the bladder itself. They move substances within the body, example, pump blood. Of course, what immediately comes to mind is the heart, and they also produce heat. In terms of the breakdown of glucose, when you're looking at aerobic respiration, glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide, water, and energy, energy in the form of ATP, but also what is also produced as a byproduct is heat, particularly when you look at muscle contraction, which is why, as many of us will be familiar with, when you do exercise, you generate not only quote unquote sweat, but you also generate quite a bit of heat. And similarly, when you're putting a cold situation, which is why you automatically begin to shiver because shivering, what it does, not only does it um, cause the breakdown of stored uh, food stores, but it also causes as a quote unquote uh, byproduct, it generates heat. So there are three major types of muscle and these are shown here, the skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. So skeletal muscle, if you would notice, two of them are striated, and we will look towards the end of this chapter, we'll look at images showing these particular types of tissue. So they're striated in terms of the contraction, both skeletal and cardial muscle, cardiac muscle, they contract rather quickly, and that is important, particularly when you think about skeletal muscle and quick contraction. If it is, let's say you have the intervention of adrenaline, also known as uh, epinephrine, and you need to move quickly away from an area in terms of running for the skeletal muscle, yes, indeed, you will want quick contraction. And of course, for cardiac muscle, the contraction is quick in order to maintain blood the homeostasis or the homeostatic environment associated with the cardiovascular system within the human body. Smooth muscle on the other hand, ah, it's a little slower visceral, which means it usually um, occurs within the, um, within the body itself. The visceral, when you think about visceral action of smooth muscle, what comes to mind would be the digestive system and the movement of food, let's say, once you have ingested it. So once it has been ingested, the movement through the small and large intestine is brought about through the aid of smooth muscle. Is it, now, in terms of the movement voluntary, yes, skeletal muscle, 
Yes, you do have some which are, but you also have reflexive or reflex actions which are not under voluntary control. So for instance, uh, some of us might be aware when we were looking at the nervous system and we looked at some of the um, actions which are carried out at the level of the spine in terms of spinal reflexes, such as if you touch a hot stove, not enough time to send it up to the brain to process, right? If you wait at that length of time, you'll have a barbecue hand. So what happens is at the level of the spine, you have that reflex action. And you know, as soon as you touch something hot, you have your hand pulling away. And that does involve the skeletal muscle in that regard. Um, is it subject to fatigue? Yes, skeletal muscle. And again, for those of us who exercise, we will be familiar with this. When you exercise for a certain length of time, oh yes, you feel the burn as they say. You do feel the fatigue where that is concerned. Okay, so here is just showing the location of the three types of muscle. Skeletal muscle as shown here in the biceps brachii. Here you see it. The cardiac muscle found in the heart and the smooth muscles which are found in the stomach and the intestines, large and small. Let me ask this question. What would happen if you, let's say, do, could you find cardiac muscle anywhere except in the heart? I'm showing that question out. Would you find it anywhere else except in the heart? Cardiac muscle. What do you think? So we're showing that out, we're showing that question out. Angeli, what do you think? Other than the heart, do you think anywhere else in the body has cardiac muscle? Sir, so I'm not sure, but I don't I don't think it have anywhere else in the body with a cardiac muscle. You're quite right. Hence the reason they call it cardiac. Cardiac is very specific yeah. to the heart itself. And when in general, when you look at tissues. Right, tissues are very specific for specific certain areas in the body. Now, there's one disease state in which tissues, which they move from where they're supposed to be to other areas. Anybody know what is that disease state called? Six letters begins with C. And that's actually how they detect it because they find tissue which is not supposed to be in one area, they find it somewhere else. And that's how you know you, they, you have this disease condition. It begins with C. Yeah, very good. Cancer, yes. Specifically metastatic cancer, cancer which has moved from one area to the other. So like for instance, let's say um, a gentleman who has testicular cancer, what they will see is, you know, tissues associated with the testes, let's say they find it somewhere else growing as a tumor. So when they do the histological analysis and they recognize, hello, Jello, we're finding, you know, testicular tissue, we're finding it somewhere else. Then they will know, okay, let's have a look at the testes and see what is going on. Clearly, this is something abnormal associated with the testes, such that this tissue is found at a distal site and, you know, and growing in a tumor. So that's how they actually detect it when they find um, tissues which are not supposed to be there somewhere else. All right. That's one way they detect metastatic cancers. All right, let's go forward. Um, before going forward, let me just ask a question. What type of muscle make up the stomach? Is it smooth, skeletal, or cardiac? What do you think? Which one make? Smooth, yes, yes, very good, right? So that is very good, smooth muscle. And that is a very good answer there. And very important, all muscle tissue is extensible and they could stretch without tearing. So that's one of the important things associated with muscle, they could stretch. All right. Now, in terms of just one little nugget to remember, adult muscle stem cells are called satellite. They produce myoblasts, which fuse to form the skeletal muscle fibers. So this is just how, this is the genesis of muscle fibers, right? They start with skeletal cells that produce myoblasts, and these myoblasts then fuse to form skeletal muscle fibers. Now let's have a look at the structure of skeletal muscle. Now, muscle fibers, they are packed they are packed with myofibrils or myofibrils, as some people call it. Numerous muscle fibers are packed together to form a fascicle, and many fascicles are packed together to form a muscle. Now, one of the things you would notice and probably appreciate is, you know, this um, this uni very similar to when we are looking at nerves. So nerves, where you have, you know, the individual um, 
portions of the nerves making up the entire nerve fiber. Very similarly, with skeletal muscle, you have the very same thing in terms of the individual portions making up the total muscle fiber. So, hmm, interesting. Wonder how did <laughs> yeah, a little um let me just go back there. I don't know how that oh I think I probably pressed that in error. Um let me see how to clear this off. Okay. Right. Let me just take one, go back one. Okay. So here we see then the individual fibers, right? The fibers are collectively um, they're collected here and they're surrounded by endomycium. And these now in terms of they form a fascicle. These fascicle now they're surrounded by epimycium and collectively they form the skeletal muscles. So that's very important in terms of the structural arrangements of the muscle fire of skeletal muscle. So now, what is a muscle unit? So this is showing the muscle unit. And here it is, all of the muscle fibers that are innervated from the spine, from one uh, spinal cord nerve. So here, for instance, you have from a group of neurons, sorry. So here you have the neurons, the somatic motor neurons located in the spinal cord. And here it is, you seeing they're innervating uh, a, a different a set of uh, nerve fibers. And of course, in terms of where the nerve meets the muscle, that's a neuromuscular junction. And this neuromuscular junction is shown in a little bit more of a detail here. So very important, the motor unit, it does consist of the somatic neuron and the skeletal muscle it innervates. So that's very important. So this is showing here the motor neuron axons, right? So each one of these is a motor unit very importantly here. So this, in terms of, of, of the innovation, these two are being innovated. This is motor unit A. These two are being innovated from this individual um, motor neuron. And then this is, so this is called uh, C, motor unit C, motor unit B. These two are being innovated from this neuron or nerve cell. So nerve cell and the, very importantly, that which it innovates that makes up a motor unit. So again, here, this is the neuromuscular junction shown on a micrograph, right? And again, this is the junction between the nerve and the muscle itself, neuromuscular junction. All right, so I have a question for you. What is the space that separates the neuron and the muscle cell? So when we look at a neuromuscular junction, there's a little space between the neuron and the muscle itself. What is that space called? It begins with C. Five letters, and it rhymes with left. It's called a synaptic. Cleft? Cleft, yes, yes. So a cleft is actually a space. So for instance, could you think of another disease state where cleft is used? And it implies that a space is there, cleft, related to, let's say, the oral cavity. Cleft palate, very good. Yeah, so for persons with cleft palate, what is, when you look at them, you see they're, they're actually missing a space in the palate itself. Of course, this could be corrected, you know, when they're quite young in terms of from a surgical intervention. It's usually done at that point in time. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So in terms of muscle contraction, what are the steps? So first the electrical signal comes in the synaptic motor neuron. And then at the synapses at the neuromuscular junction, you have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that crosses the synaptic cleft. And then you have the regeneration of the action potential. So you have an electrical signal now in the sarcolemma. And then you have a chemical signal occurring in the sarcoplasm. Let's see all of those things, what they look like. So here it is, you have the action potential. This is, so this is the nerve cell on the neuron. The action potential coming down on the outside or the outside of the nerve itself. 
when acetylcholine binds with acetyl, oh, this is once you have secretion, but once you do have this action potential coming along, what does happen is not shown here. Actually, calcium channels open, calcium rushes in and binds to these vesicles, causing now these synaptic vesicles to fuse with the membrane, the presynaptic membrane, and releasing acetylcholine. So they left out that bit here. So once the acetylcholine is released, it now binds, you have these receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So it binds to its receptor. And when it binds, it causes sodium in intake in the postsynaptic membrane. When sodium intake, of course, this causes depolarization of the membrane. And when you have depolarization and it reaches threshold, you have the regeneration of the action potential. Right, so that is, that is very important. We looked at this when we were looking at nerves uh, previously, so I wouldn't get into any, anything further. But very important to note as well, um, in terms of the acetylcholine, uh, you do have reuptake of acetylcholine, but that which is not reuptake, that is not reuptake, it is broken down by acetylcholine esterase, right? So this is an enzyme that is present within the synaptic cleft and it breaks down acetylcholine because you don't want it uh, to remain here because if it does, you'll have tetany or you'd have constant stimulation of this membrane here. So that's why it has to be broken down and wait until you have another signal or depolarization coming along the neuron and the whole cycle repeating once more. All right, so in terms of, the, of how the, contra the movement itself, how does it work? Now on the e-classroom, there's a video which explains this in great detail in terms, and it shows you physically the movement. So I would uh, strongly recommend you do have a look at that video because it explains it in, in, in some detail how this contraction and relaxation occurs in terms of facilitating the lengthening and the shortening of the muscle fibers itself. But here's an example in terms of what is shown here. So when, when pencils overlap, and when the overlap between the pencils increase, the sarcomeres shorten, all right? So when you, when you do have it and they shorten, you have this contraction occurring and the whole sarcomere in this distance actually shorten. So you have the thick filaments and the thin filaments shown here as a thick and thin pencil. All right, so this movement is what facilitates it. And it's a nice way to remember it because if you're thinking of it like pencils, you could think of the racers as the Z discs. Z discs. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right? So you could think of it as the Z discs in terms of the razor. So it's a nice analogy in terms of remembering what it looks like and the movement which occurs. And then, of course, you could take that knowledge and then look at the diagrams, which outlines, you know, the Z discs, thick and thin filaments, and it would show you how the movement occurs. So during muscle contraction, it's important to remember that both the sarcomeres and the myofibrils shorten. But the myofilaments, always remember that they don't change in length, but it's only the sarcomeres and the myofibrils that do the shortening. So this is just showing you the, again the thick and the thin filaments in terms of what happens. So what, what actually you have, you have these binding sites and literally it binds and it pulls itself along. So you have this like a ratchet type movement. And again, sorry, I didn't um, have the video, but it shows you nicely in terms of the movement. Maybe as we go along, I might take a break and put the video up to show you the ratcheting action, which occurs that allows for the shortening of the muscle fiber. Of course, um, usually in the unbound state, you have troponin covering the binding site, but this moves once you do have activation to allow the binding to the muscle. Oops, sorry. So this, do pay attention when, you, when you're reviewing this in terms of looking at the whole notion of muscle contraction. Let's have a look. So first what happens, myosin binding sites on the actin are covered in the resting fibers. So this is where they usually bind, but they are covered. So second, 
when you have the action potential, as we saw, coming down the neuron, and then of course, it travels across the synaptic cleft via the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, then binds to the postsynaptic membrane, allowing sodium in. And then when the sodium comes in, it causes depolarization and then release of calcium. Right, so calcium is then released from the sarcoplasm, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Then what you have happening, calcium binds to the troponin. So this is troponin here, and troponin actually is covering the binding sites where this usually binds and causing movement. So the calcium binds to the troponin, and tropomyosin moves, revealing myosin binding sites. All right, so then what, when that happens, the cross bridge forms. So now you have. Uh, here you have the heads, they now bind, they're able to bind to the sites because calcium has bound to troponin and move it off. So they bind to the sites and when they bind, you have a ratcheting movement and AD, ATP is um, released uh, and the energy, ATP is released forming ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that energy, the energy that is, is we're looking at bond energy, the energy that exists between these two in terms of a chemical bond that is actually used, that energy to call this, cause the movement. So the energy is used causing the movement and in so doing when that energy is used, well, now ADP is released plus inorganic phosphate. So it's a chemical reaction that causes this movement and is known as the power stroke. Once the power stroke is finished, the myosin head releases actin when a fresh ATP binds. So other than that, it will remain attached to it. Now, when you have a fresh ATP being bound, it releases. Now, very importantly, take note that it will remain bound to it until it will not release um, the muscle fiber until you have fresh ATP coming in, all right, and binding. When fresh ATP comes in and binds, it now releases it. And when it does so, the myosin head binds the next actin, right? And the ATP is cleaved to ADP plus P and the cycle is re repeated once more. So you have this cycle going on all the time, right? So ATP is being bound here. And when, it's, when the ATP is bound, it releases the fiber and now it goes into its relaxed state. Then of course, what you have happening again, when another impulse is released, calcium is released, it, it um, then, causes the revealing of the binding site. And now you have ATP will bind to it using that energy, bond energy from ATP. It will release it. It will release, um, using that energy, it will cause the movement of the fiber. And in so doing, it releases ADP plus P. So it's bond energy that is used. And this cycle keeps repeating in a ratcheting motion to actually shorten the fiber. So that's repeated over and over. And it, this is actually goes through, shows, speaks to the same thing. The action potential simulates acetylcholine release. It induces an action potential in the muscle fiber. Within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you have the release of calcium. Calcium in, causes tropomyosin the displacement. So tropomyosin usually covers the binding site of these heads. So once tropomyosin is released, myosin forms cross bridges with actin. So the, this is actin here. So it forms a cross bridge and you have a ratcheting motion and it moves it forward, leading to shortening of the fiber. And of course, only when ATP um, comes back and binds to it, would you have a release. And then it goes back to it, this ratcheting action could occur again. You know, and it happens over and over until you have short, complete shortening of the fiber itself. All right, so this is just uh, saying the same thing. The neuron stops firing the action potential. When you have relaxation now, acetylcholine release ceases because remember, usually when you have the action potential coming down here, as you mentioned, you do have channels opening, calcium coming in, um, you have fusion to the presynaptic membrane, release of acetylcholine, it binds its receptor, open sodium channel, sodium goes in, and then it comes to the calcium, causes release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when everything stops in terms of when the neuron has stopped giving its action potential or stop generating that current, what you have happening, everything stops, right? The sarcoplasmic reticulum, it stops calcium release and a pump 
returns all of the calcium ions. So now you have reuptake of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So without calcium, the tropomyosin hides, hides myosin binding site. So in the absence of calcium, very important, calcium keeps the binding sites open. So in the absence of calcium, the tropomyosin then comes back and covers the binding site. So therefore, myosin cannot bind to actin and it cannot form the cross bridges. Therefore, the tin filaments, they slide back to their resting position. And that's how you have muscle relaxation occurring, in essence, because of the absence of those um, action, potential, action potentials coming down the entire uh, process. So very interestingly, this whole process, as I said, if you look on the website, on the e-classroom, there's a video showing, showing it. So you just have to revisit it and just appreciate what is happening there, you know, in terms of the steps. And um, it will make, you know, it will give you a deeper appreciation for the whole notion of muscle, of muscle contraction and relaxation. So this is just going through the steps in relaxation. Acetylcholine release stops. Nicotinic receptor channels close and sarcoplasmic repolarizes. So those receptors, right, the acetylcholine that is released from the terminal of the nerve and crosses, remember they cross the synapse, right? And it binds to these nicotinic receptors. And when they bind, it causes the opening of sodium channels. When sodium channels open, sodium rushes in, depolarizes the membrane. So in terms of in their absence, none of that happens. And because when you do have depolarization, um, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So since that is in the absence of that impulse, the sarcoplasmic, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the channels close and actively calcium is reuptaken into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And tropomyosin, which is like a cover, you think about tropomyosin like the cover, a safety, a safety cover. It now covers the binding sites. So actin cannot bind to myosin anymore or myosin cannot myosin cannot bind to actin anymore so therefore it moves off and then you have the passive it goes back to its relaxed state which is the increase in length all right so in terms of energy production right you do have atp stores energy and i mentioned this in terms of the bond energy so the atp you can think about it as an energy in diphosphate and a rich energy bond attached to phosphate. So therefore, when you have um, lysis of that, and you have ADP being generated, and this is the inorganic phosphate that is released. So the third phosphorus, it forms this phosphate, but most critically, that bond energy, ADP plus, so you can think of ATP as ADP plus a P, and it's a high energy bond. So now in the, when you do have the lysis occurring, it forms ADP plus P, that P forms phosphate, and most critically, energy is given off. And it's this energy that is used to form that ratcheting action or the movement of the myosin head on the actin. That is very important there. So where does this energy come from? Well, in terms of getting that ATP, where does it come from? Well, glycolysis is the fastest one. Glycolysis, as the name implies, gly relating to um, glucose, breakdown of glucose um, in terms of generating ATP. And you could also get it from the mitochondria itself. Let's have a, a closer look at that. So in terms of energy production, one, you could get it from creatinine phosphate, uh, creatinine phosphate being broken down to creatine. Now this is from protein metabolism, creatine, right? So creatinine, creatine phosphate going to creatine, this could lead to the generation of ATP. But the fastest one, which is used is glycolysis. And glycolysis, this is at the level of the cytoplasm, Well, you have two to three ATP being generated at the level of the cytoplasm when you have glycogen. Glycogen is a form of sugar that is stored in the liver. So when it is, you no longer have need for um, sugars in the blood, or in the body itself is stored as glycogen in the liver. And of course is also stored as fat in some cases, but glycogen is much more efficient in terms of the release of that energy. So when you do need it, glycogen is broken down and it generates ATP. But importantly, in terms of, of the process of glycolysis, pyruvate is generated and this is shunted into the mitochondria and within the mitochondria per 
glucose molecules, you have 30 ATP being generated. So this is just showing you then where the energy comes from for um, muscle contraction. It could be derived from one, breakdown of protein, and two, breakdown of sugars, right? So this is just showing you. And when you have the breakdown of sugar in terms of glycolysis, initiated by glycogen, which is stored in the liver itself, what you have happening is three, that is produced at the level of the cytoplasm, and then the pyruvate is shunted into mitochondria within the cell itself, and when the pyruvate is broken down, it generates more. It generates approximately 30 ATP per glucose molecule. Okay, so one of the things to take take home as it relates to ATP. ATP binding causes the cross bridge to release. That is very important. Other than that, it will remain there. It will remain attached to cross bridge. You'll have cross bridge formation in terms of that myosin actin uh, attachment. It'll stay that way. That is very important to note that ATP causes the cross bridge to release. Other than that, you would have that continuous binding of myosin and actin. All right, so this is just showing aerobic versus anaerobic muscle function. Um, of course, with aerobic, as the name implies, aerobic referring to air, anaerobic, and meaning not aerobic. So that means in the absence of air or oxygen. So in aerobic, oxygen is required. Mitochondria provide the ATP. And an example is jogging, right, for endurance activities. Whereas with anaerobic muscle function, it occurs in the absence of oxygen. Glycolytic fibers provide quick energy kick, but you do have the building up of lactic acid. And I think if we have any sprinters or anybody who has run, you know, rather quickly for a short space of time, when you have that lactic acid build up, you know, you feel the burn in the muscle, as we call it, right? You feel the burn. That is just the muscle fatigue that is occurring there. All right. So this is just showing muscle fiber types, type one and type two. Uh, it's beyond the, the scope of the class. We don't really have to know the difference between them. As, it, as is that um, slide there, you don't have to get into that detail. Uh, in terms of muscle fatigue, we don't have to get into this much detail as it relates to it. Right, muscle contraction. This is just showing, you know, what happens during uh, muscle contraction in terms of the right, the right. Um, this is contraction strength versus the sarcomere length. So therefore, when it's just right, you have a maximum maximal amount of contraction strength. You don't want it to get to be too long because actually, when it is very long, you have, uh, in terms of the strength, it actually goes down. So you have the maximal amount at this point, And that is why, you know, it's important when you do your exercises that you do keep the, do follow, you know, the instructions related to this. This is not required for this class. All right, that is not required. Not required. Okay, so with this one, in terms of the types of contraction, let me just mention them. The isotonic, concentric, and eccentric contraction, these are the three which we, you will be responsible for. Isotonic is a dynamic shortening of muscle that maintains a constant force, example, chewing food. The topic of chewing food, if I were to ask you, what is the strongest muscle in the body? What would you say? Let me see if anybody could relate it to chewing food. Which, which one is the strongest muscle in the body? Related to chewing. It begins with M. Well, we, we haven't run through all of the muscles related to the jaw itself, but it's the masseter, right? The masseter muscle or your jaw muscle, right? That's the one, it, it, that is the strongest in terms of providing force, right? This is why some people, when biting is really a serious weapon in that regard. Okay, let's go forward. Concentric contraction, myofilament slide, psychomere, and this is what happens. And with eccentric contraction, this is what happens. Let's see diagrammatically what it looks like. So in terms of the contraction with isometric, the muscle length does not change. 
with concentric, the muscle shortens. And with eccentric, when we're looking at the biceps, the muscle lengthens, all right? So take note of these three muscle positions as it relates to contraction. So the thing common to all muscle contraction is the force, right? The force that is produced, not the muscle itself. All right. So smooth versus skeletal, is there a difference? Oh, yes, there is. Let's have a look. So smooth muscles, they have short plump cells. They're built on intermediate filaments connected by dense layered in sheets and calcium comes, calcium ions can come through. Whereas the skeletal is a little different. As it relates to this course, you will not be requested or required to know this information. This is a little beyond the scope of the syllabus itself. So I would just move over that, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now we are coming um, to pay attention to this point. We're coming to the muscles themselves. So we looked at the muscle fibers. We saw how contraction occurs. We see we saw where the energy comes from for contraction as it relates to um, breakdown of glycogen, sugar, or in some cases fat. And now let's look at the muscles themselves. So the muscles which you which are important, which you should be required to know, those associated with the head itself, namely the temporalis, the orbicularis oculi. And the reason why they call it the oculi, you have two oculi, you have the orbicularis oculi as shown here. And it's a circular muscle associated with the eye. And you have the orbicularis oris around the mouth. It's a circular. Those are two of the circular muscles, um, probably the only ones other than the pupil the one associated with the uh, pubic, but that's not a muscle, you have suspend, suspend ligaments attached there. So the orbicularis oculi and the orbicularis oris, these are circular muscles around the eye and the mouth. Around the eye, it, it allows you to give a blink and also like a, what they call the sweet eye, you know, that little twisting of the eye. And you could say the orbicularis oris, you could call it the suited muscle. You know, when you make that noise, right, that is, brought about because of the action of orbicularis oris. Here you have the zygomaticus. And anybody know why they call this the zygomaticus muscle? Since we already look at skeleton. No, we're looking at the skeleton tomorrow. So the zygomaticus, as you will see, this is a zygomatic bone which underlies it. So one of the things in terms of the naming, and you'll see that when we do the skeleton tomorrow, uh, you will notice that there's a correlation between the naming of the muscle in a lot of cases and the underlying bone itself. So this was the muscle I was referring to, the strongest muscle in the body, the masseter or your jaw muscle that produces the most force uh, within the body itself, this, this little muscle here, the masseter. Where do you think the smallest muscle is in the body? So this is the strongest. Where do you think the smallest muscle is? We looked at it actually last day and it's related to the smallest bone in the body. So where do you yeah. think it's, yep, right? And what is the smallest bone in the body? I forgot, the smallest bone, which one? It's one of the, in the inner, in the middle air. So that me is either the malleus incus or the stapes. Which one do you think it the is? Stapes. The stapes, right. So therefore the muscle that actually uh, regulates or keep the stapes in position. That's actually the smallest muscle in the body. And in fact, in terms of how small it is, it's one millimeter long, right? How much is one millimeter? If you take your thumb and forefinger, press them together, and you now move them apart, when you now start to see a little distance, a little clearing between the thumb and forefinger, that is a millimeter. So that is actually the length of that muscle that holds the stapes bone in position. Let's go forward. Here you have the sternocleidomastoid going again um, up to the mastoid region past the sternum, right? So very important, the sternocleidomastoid muscle shown here. Um, the zygomaticus, you mentioned that one, it goes across the zygomaticus bone. The, occip the occipital frontalis or the frontal belly, which is shown here. Coming down, you have the trapezius. We'll see this better um, in just a little bit. You have the deltoid muscle, so-called because it looks like a delta, the Greek letter delta, which is like a triangle. And in fact, this muscle looks like a triangle. If it, it goes all the way to the back as well, it's like a big triangle. 
Here you have the pectoralis major shown here. Uh, coming down the biceps brachii, right? Which is the muscle we like to flex when we're showing off our muscle as a child. Whenever you go to a child, let me see your muscles, right? They'll flex their arm and they'll show this muscle off. All right. Then over the triceps, so the biceps on the outside, the tricep on the inside, the triceps is external to it. Coming down here in terms of the muscles, the sartorius gracilis muscles shown there. The rectus femoris, and again named because the, fem, uh, the femur actually it runs right, the bone runs right, right, below, right below it. This is the patella, of course, your knee, and of course, this very important muscle, the gastrocnemius, right? That's the calf muscle. The gastrocnemius, if you'll notice, is attached to this uh, very important tendon here. Anybody knows the name of this tendon? There's a story in Greek mythology about it, this tendon. And the story goes that this person did something very good. So the gods wanted to, of course, reward him. So they dipped him in the river Styx uh, to give him immortality. But in so doing, when they dipped him, they held him here by the ankle when they dipped him. So this was his one weak point. And his name, of course, was Achilles. So hence the name, this is the Achilles tendon. And in fact, if ever you have a serious rupture or if it's cut the Achilles tendon, believe you me, you're not going anywhere. You will, be, you will lose the ability to walk, right? You wouldn't be able to walk. You'll have to drag yourself along because this tendon attaches the gastrocnemius most critically to the calcaneus or your heel, calcaneus bone, which is a heel that is very important in terms of the endpoint of the attachment. So if this is cut, yeah, you're not going anywhere. You will not have any movement in your leg. You'll have to drag yourself along. Could it be um, repaired surgically? Yes, it could. And this injury usually happens, so it will be happening quite frequently with basketballers in terms of rupture of the Achilles tendon. You also do have it as well with some footballers. You have the, so both basketballers and footballers are susceptible to injuries related to the Achilles. But it's very rare because if ever you do see it, and you, you probably will see it, you know, during your professional career, if you have not already done so, it looks like a cable, the Achilles tendon in section. So it's, it's quite thick. And literally, you see these little divisions and it looks just like a, a, a wire cable. So for that to rupture or to be or cut completely is very difficult, right, in terms of it, of it um, occurring. And hence the reason why, you know, it is in terms structurally the way it is, because you really don't want it because of its importance in terms of movement for you. You don't want any rupturing occurring there. Let's look at the back now, the posterior view. So here it is, we mentioned the masseter, right? And this is the trapezius, this is the other part of the trapezius. So again, oops, we'll just take a little go back. Right, this is the other half of the trapezius muscle here. This is your Therese minor and major on the back. Your deltoid muscle, for those of us who um, probably do uh, a lot of weight, muscle development, you'll be familiar with these. The triceps, we mentioned those. When we come down here, of course, this is your gluteus maximus, also known as your buttock muscle. Right. So this one, of course, this is very important because it lends support to the lower back and the pelvis facilitating movement. Right. So your gluteus maximus is important in that regard, as is all the others. But in particular for movement, the gluteus maximus is very important. Uh, here you have the gluteus medius as well. Looking for so both of them, you know, they do lend support to the lower back and pelvis, very important for movement. Here are the hamstring muscles, the group. And come down here, we did mention the gastrocnemius. Notice it's two, two parts to it. And again, this is the calcaneal tendon, also known as the Achilles tendon. And the reason they call it the calcaneal tendon, because it does attach to the calcaneus bone or your heel bone. So, you know, do remember that when next you go out and you go to, let's say if you go for those of us down south, you go to Charlie's, you know, and you say, hey, give me a bowl of calcania soup. And they say, wah. And they say, I want a bowl of cow calcania soup. And we're like, wah. And they say, yes, cow heel soup. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, that's a little biological joke. Let's go forward. So, in terms of muscles of facial expression, 
we did mention these most critically in terms of blinking or giving sweet eye, the orbicularis or oculi, very important there. For whistling or suiting, in particular, you have this other circular one, the orbicularis oris. How would you tell the difference between the two? Do remember oris usually refers to the oral cavity, hence OR, oral cavity, whereas oculi, ocular, refers to the eye itself. So hence, that's the difference between the two if ever you get mixed up. You know, you could link the name, name, the nomenclature, or the names associated with them. Nasalis bone, of course, related to your nose itself. The boxinator, right? This is the one also found in the face. Mentalis, shown here. Right, and this is just showing, showing the muscles associated with jaw. Notice the masseter, look how big it is. I mentioned strongest muscle in the body, the masseter, right? Notwithstanding the fact of persons developing their muscles, you know, using other means in the gym or otherwise, but you do have naturally the masseter is the strongest one. And because of the fact for chewing and it's, it's used a lot, you know, from birth uh, straight up. Right, so hence it is very well, very well developed uh, muscle itself. This is the uh, trapezius muscle again, close to the neck. Um, and just one more, I want to point out the temporalis. When we look at the skeleton tomorrow, you will see the, of course, there's the temporal bone, so the temporalis associated muscle naming associated because the underlying bone is the uh, temple, the, tem the temporal bone or the temple bone. All right, so muscle controlling head and draw, head and the jaw and moving the head. All right, so these are certain motions, take note of them. So you have protraction is when you push your head forward, retraction of course, in terms of the lower jaw. Protraction is when the lower jaw passes the plane of the upper jaw and retraction is the reverse when the lower jaw is beneath the plane of the upper jaw. So everybody, let me see you protract, protract your jaw, push it out and then pull it back in for retraction. Very good. The other one again, elevation and depression. This is open and closing your jaw as if you're knocking your teeth together. Then you have flexion, extension and hypertension, bringing your neck forward, bringing it in the upright position and then carrying it back. Right, flexion, extension and hyperextension is when you carry it back. <laughs> Right, that, those three movements, I'm, I'm guessing you all are doing it and getting the same reaction. Rotation, of course, going left and right, that is very important in terms of when you're playing, if you're following a game of tennis, you, you, you use that motion. Then you have lateral flexion, is when you're keeping your head steady and moving it to the side, whereas rotation is when the entire head is being moved. All right, so, those are some of the motions associated with the muscles, with the head and neck. Let's have a look at those muscles in the thorax for breathing. We look, you'll see more of this when we look at respiration in yet SNF2, but in terms of the major muscles for respiration, are the intercostals or the muscles between the ribs themselves. Other than the intercostal, intercostals, the internal and external ones, you have the diaphragm. And in the major muscle of breathing is in fact the diaphragm. And this is here it is in the relaxed position. One of the things I like to call the diaphragm, I like to call it the guts pusher donger muscle. Why do I like to call it the guts pusher donger muscle? Because it just, it does just that. When times come, when the time comes for you to inhale, what happens? This pushes down. Oops, sorry, we'll just go back up. Oops, oops, my bad, my bad, my fault. Right. It pushes down on the viscera, visceral organs. It pushes down literally and creates more space for the lungs to expand. And that is very important. Then when you relax, it comes back into its dome shape. So this is in its relaxed state. It's a dome, but when you when it contracts, it flattens. And as it flattens, it pushes down the visceral organs, creating space now for the lungs to expand. So again, the three major muscles associated with respiration, diaphragm, internal and external intercostal muscles. All right, these are some of the others, but we'd speak more to those when we are doing respiration. Um, we don't have to look at these, those associated with the spine. 
no, we'd look at these more when we are doing reproduction, right, in terms of those muscles associated with the male and female reproductive tracts. All right, so these are just push mentioning in terms of the upper part, those muscles that move and cause stabilization of the pectoral girdle. Of course, you have two, you have the pelvis, the pectoral girdle is the upper girdle. We have two girdles within the body. And when we look at the skeleton, we'll speak to that. So the upper one, you have the trapezius, you have trapezius muscle, the latissimus dorsi. All right, I like to think about it. How do I remember its location? I think of a horsey. I mean, think about a horsey, you know, you usually put the saddle on the back of the horse. So therefore, so therefore I remember the latissimus dorsi is on the back. It's a back muscle, All right? So it's just showing um, the location because it is removed. It's a big muscle that usually covers here. So underneath the latissimus dorsi, you will find the uh, trapezius, the superior and inferior part of the trapezius. So this is just, um, showing the muscles that move the arm at the shoulder joint, right? The, supraspina, the supraspinatus, right? This is just showing it here. And of course, this is the deltoid in section. So they, you have to cut away the deltoid to actually see the supraspinatus muscle. Over here, we see the teres minor and major muscles. This bone, of course, is the humerus muscle. Sorry, the humerus bone. And these are again showing the muscles that move the arm, the humerus at the shoulder joint. This is just showing what on the uh, on the other side, the ventral or belly side. Here you have your pectoralis muscle, the major. And in terms of the pectoralis, you have the superior, anterior, and medial deltoid, which covers the pectoralis. So muscles that move the forearm and hand and the fingers is shown here, the triceps, brachy. The, these are the ones, of course, um, which are shown uh. here, right? And then you have the extensor muscles, the carpi radialis and the carpi ulnaralis. And again, these are related to the bones, the radius and the ulna, hence their name. The radius runs here, which is continuous, of course, with the thumb itself and the ulna is the other bone. So the extensor radialis runs um, closer or in line with the thumb, whereas the ulnaralis runs closer in line with the ulna. And they are so named because they overlie these bones. We're almost there, six more slides. So the muscles that move the forearm, right? These are the ones, the brachialis and the brachio, brachioradialis. These are the ones associated with moving the forearm. Right? And in terms of the movements themselves, please take note of this one when you are reviewing it, these motions. Let me, let me just go through them. So flexion and extension, right? Flexion is moving the arm towards the body, whereas extension is moving it away from the hand. We're looking at the hand, moving the hand closer towards the head, flexion, moving it away. This is extension. Pronation and supination. So pronation, the palm is down as shown here, supination, your palm is open. So when you're looking at the anatomical position, you um, usually it's in, the, uh, it's in the supination position. And here you have abduction and adduction. Abduction means towards the thumb in terms of the movement, whereas adduction is away from the thumb. So this is the thumb. If you're moving away from the thumb, you'll be moving in this direction. If you're moving towards the thumb, it's moving in this direction here. In terms of the wrist joint, right hand, if it's at, uh, let's say you're laying it flat, flexion and extension. Flexion, you're bringing it closer towards the body. Extension, you're flattening it or moving it away. And similarly with the finger joints, flexion and extension. All right, five more slides. Muscles that move the leg and thigh. All right, so we're looking at these. Uh, we did mention them already, the major muscles of the thigh itself, the gracilis, sartorius muscles. Um, those are very important in terms of the movement. And also the major muscle groups, you have the quadriceps, so usually when you're thinking of the thigh in particular, or the leg, we're looking at the, um, at the region, uh, 
the what we're looking at here, the patella, right? So okay, so this is <laughs> the the spine actually threw me off. I thought for a while we were looking at the dorsal region, but this is actually ventral, but it just cut away, right? So here we have the patella. So this is how you could tell, you know, if you're in a pinch, you're like, hmm, which one is it? So the patella. So we're looking at the frontal view, and it's showing then these different muscle groups. Here we are looking at the back, of course, the gluteus maximus muscle. Um, major muscle, as we said, um, very important, as is these two, which we'll see in just a little bit. This is the gastrocnemius muscle, which is very important for movement of the lower leg. So again, these movements, which are very similar, abduction, moving away, adduction, you're bringing it closer. A nice way how I remember it is think about adding the legs. With adduction, you have two, but when you abduct, you only have one leg left. So add, you know, you have two legs on the ground, but with abduction, you only have one. Add, you know, so add, you know, one plus one is two. That's how I remember it. Whichever way, you know, you choose, that's fine. Lateral and medial, of course, in terms of the motions, medial towards the midline, lateral is away. And flexion, you bring up your leg. Extension, like if, you, if there's a ball, when you kick the ball, that's extension. Right, and then you have flexion again, right, going away, hyperextension when you're moving it backward. All right, so we're getting down to the foot and toes, and these are some of the important ones. Of course, the ligament is very important. You have the soleus, gastrocnemius muscle, the tibialis anterior, and again, reason of its importance because of the tibia, right, that's very important. And here you have the um, the patellar ligament very, to stabilize, of course, the muscles and is a point of attachment for many of them. In the lateral view of the right leg, here you're showing the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscle, the tibialis muscle, and the fibularis longus muscles. And again, do take note, very important one is the gastrocnemius, right? Very important. And again, calcaneal tendon down to the calcaneus or your heel bone. And the last slide we'll be looking at in terms of the muscles that move the foot, these are showing again the motions, inversion, right? You're moving it towards the internal and aversion is away, right? Inversion, so you're rocking on your, on your little toe when you invert, but eversion, you're pulling it and you're rocking more on your, the, your big toe, as it were, and you're kicking up your little uh, toe in the air in terms of using the plane of the big toe as a pivot point. Flexion and extension is also shown there. All right, so that will be um, it for muscle today. So what did we look at? Well, we look at the structure of muscle, different type, smooth cardiac and striated muscle. We looked at their locations, most specifically uh, smooth muscle in the visceral area of the large and small intestine, cardiac muscle in the heart, and of course, skeletal muscle located all over our bodies as we just saw in terms of differentiating and identifying them. We looked at the whole process involving shortening and lengthening of muscle, very important. Uh -huh the sliding filament theory that is very important as it relates to the um, lengthening and shortening of muscle and how they actually perform. We also saw in terms of how this is brought about by the release of acetylcholine across this neuromuscular junction and it crosses and then the postsynaptic membrane, you have depolarization, which leads to the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, leading to the remo removal of troponin from the binding site, causing myosin to bind actin, right? And ATP, of course, being used, uh, is, the energy from ATP uh, is used to produce the power stroke or produce or to produce the shortening of the muscle fiber itself. Of course, once ADP is bound to the ATP, um, you don't have any movement, but once you do have fresh ATP that displaces the ADP and you have the whole process going over again, over and over until you have the contraction of the muscle itself. In the absence of stimulation, you have the reuptake of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin then binds or covers the um, binding site. So myosin can no longer bind to actin and therefore the muscle fiber now goes back to its normal length. As I mentioned, all of this is, is covered in the e-classroom. It has a nice video there for you to have a look at. 
Then we went on to look at the location of the different muscles in the body itself, in muscles of the head, the orbicularis oris and orbicularis oculi, circular muscles associated with the eye and mouth respectively, right? So without the orbicularis ocu um, oris, you will not be hearing me because I wouldn't have the ability to move my mouth or move my lips to form these words. So very importantly, they're one of the more important muscles associated with the face is in the orbicularis oris. And again, the orbicularis oculi, very important for moving your eyes around, right? Without it, you'd have, you'd have to move your entire head. Then we looked at the supporting muscles. Um, we did look at the gastrocnemius, very important for the flexion of the lower leg and also for your foot itself. Gastrocnemius in terms of point of attachment, it attaches, of course, to the Achilles tendon, which by extension also attaches to the calcaneus, um, calcaneal bone and that brings about that movement in the leg. In terms of the other muscles, we did look at the major muscles associated with respiration, namely the intercostals, both internal and external, and most critically, you have the diaphragm muscle, which is the most important muscle associated with um, respiration. As a side note, we did mention, of course, smallest muscle in the body, the one associated with holding the stapes in place, and the strongest muscle in the body, the masseter muscle or your jaw muscle. That is the strongest one that is found there. All right, so that will be all for today. And uh, tomorrow, we'd have the other, <laughs> the last in our 3D or, or, or three part series, right? We look at the skeletal, skeletal muscle. Um, to, excuse me, not skeletal muscle. We look at the skeleton tomorrow. All right. So tomorrow at two, ideally I'll see you all. If not, as I mentioned, it would be recorded. Okay. So for those who did come in, Kimberly, Dory, Ernest, Anjali, Ariana, Aviel, Dahia, Dahia, the here, I want to say Diane, um, Diana, and Dory. Did I forget anybody? No, no I didn't forget. I didn't forget anybody. All right. Yes. Any questions? I have one question. Yes. Yeah. I'm concerning lab tomorrow. She does a time frame for that. Could you please clarify what's happening in between a time frame? Thanks. Within the time frame or for the lab, um, yes. so so what we will do that's just set. Uh, we probably will finish before that time frame. Let me see if I could pull it. The time the time frame for the lab tomorrow. Do, 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 do. It's three forty five to four forty five for the skeletal lab. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we'd probably finish before then. So we would be revisiting some of the um, bones associated, na naming some of them, and I'd be pulling up some skeletal structures for you to look at it. But we, it probably wouldn't be, it would be, I don't think we might take the full hour in terms of doing it. Oh, but so not, it's a but, live lab. It's not a lab that we have to do up and hand up. Oh, no, no, no. So two, it's a glass thing. A good thing you did mention, um, you did bring it up to me. I want, so yes, it will be a, a live lab, but there's also a component on the e-classroom. So it's a bit of both. So when I'm finished, you will be doing a, that bit of component as well to hand up before the end of the week. But I'll talk more to that tomorrow. If you happen to miss it, it will be recorded. And um, I would post, if there's any other instructions relating to the physical write-up of the lab, I'll post it in the WhatsApp group. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, I just clarify, right? You have assessment two on Friday, 6 to 7. 6 to 7 is a Monday. Is it that it's the Friday before that, or is it that it's just on the Monday? 1st of February is a Monday. All right. Yeah. Okay, let me let me just stop the recording. How you stop the recording? I mean, you know. How you stop the recording? I mean, you know. Go to here and hit 